Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture on the decline of Spain and the wars of Louis XIV, Unit 3, Section 6 of AP European History. Today's lecture is going to be in two parts. The first will be the decline of Spain, and the second part will be on the wars of Louis XIV. So for part one, our objective is to explain how absolutist forms of rule affected social and political development from 1648 to 1815, and the key concepts are as follows. Absolute monarchies limited the nobility's participation in governance, but preserved the aristocracy's social position and legal privileges. And also, the struggle for sovereignty within and among states resulted in varying degrees of political centralization. You might even be able to apply a few other key concepts to these topics as well. <clears throat> the major themes we're going to see as we discuss the decline of Spain are going to be political, economic, and social, because all of these played a major factor in the decline of Spain. So to understand the decline of Spain, we really need to pause and review what made Spain great, all right? Why was Spain considered to be one of the most powerful states in all of Europe? Well, you might remember from Unit 1 that Spain celebrated a golden age in the 16th century. And this was really initiated by the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, a pair of new monarchs who began the process of centralizing their power. And they really set the stage for Spanish absolutism as part of this consolidation. Um, and then Charles V, who in Spain was known as Carlos I, also continued this foundation for absolutism, as did his son, Philip II. Now, at this point, with Charles V and Philip II, uh, Spain appeared to be one of the most powerful states in Europe. It definitely had the most expansive empire after the discovery of the Americas. And Spain's power really reached its zenith, meaning like its height under Philip II, who, as you might remember, is the most Catholic king. Philip II established Madrid uh, as the capital city in Castile, which would have established Castile as the dominant kingdom in Spain. Right outside of Madrid, he built a big fancy palace called the Escorial Palace to demonstrate his power, uh, much like we see Louis XIV do with Versailles. Uh, a command economy developed in Madrid, uh, of course fueled by the Atlantic trade that Spain developed among its empire. And also at this palace, there were numerous rituals of court etiquette that reinforced the king's power. So the way people behaved and dressed and the rituals that took place in the court were all designed to reinforce the king's power. And Philip was definitely a king who claimed divine right. And to enforce royal authority, the Spanish Inquisition continued to persecute those seen as heretics, especially Jews and Moors. Now remember, Moors are Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula that usually have um, an African ancestry. And so Spain continued to use religious orthodoxy and unity to enhance state power. So again, the Spanish Inquisition was a way to help consolidate political power as well as religious power because those were really one in the same in the mighty Catholic state of Spain. So there's a couple reasons for Spain's decline, but one of the biggest reasons is its economy. The Spanish economy was actually really hurt by the loss of all those middle class Moors and Jews that they kicked out in the late 15th and early 16th century. Uh, the population of Spain actually shrank by two million people over the quarter of a century as Moors and Jews were expected to leave. And of course, no Protestants were allowed in Spain. So this meant that overall, Spain had a weak commercial class. That means not many merchants or other members of the bourgeoisie. And this in turn was damaging to their manufacturing and the commercial sectors of the economy. In addition, Spanish trade with its colonies fell about 60% between 1610 and 1660. This was largely due to English and Dutch competition. 
Also, by the 17th century, which is the 1600s, the, full, the flow of bullion from the New World decreased as some of those mines began to run dry. So before long, the Spanish treasury was bankrupt, and it had to repudiate its debt at various times between 1594 and 1680. And in case you're wondering, um, repudiating your debt basically means that you are refusing to pay or honor debt that is owed. And as you can imagine, that is not something that banks appreciate very much. Uh, Philip II, who even seemed to be like one of the most powerful monarchs that Spain ever had, actually declared bankruptcy in 1596 uh, due to the economic, the dire economic conditions of Spain. And this was largely due to the many, many wars that Spain fought against other European nations in the 16th and then also into the 17th century. Spain fought so many wars that their military expenditures at the end of the 16th century were five times that of the Dutch, English, and French combined. Overall, also with that giant empire, really Spain was spread too thin. They were trying to vanquish Protestantism in Europe, fighting, the, uh, fighting England. They were also fighting off the Ottomans. They were trying to manage their new empire. Overall, it was spread way too thin, despite the appearance of so wealth, which was really an illusion. Also, national taxes in Spain hit the peasantry particularly hard. Um, many peasants were driven from the countryside and swelled the ranks of the poor in cities. Uh, this was exacerbated by bouts of plague, famine, and other agricultural struggles affected population levels and the standard of living for many peasants, hence the reason they went to the cities. But this also meant that food production decreased as a result, and so the price of foodstuffs went up. Now, this also would provoke peasant revolts in the 1640s in some Spanish territory, territories like Catalonia, Portugal, Naples, and Sicily. Most of these revolts will be suppressed, except for Portugal, which will gain their independence. Also, inflation from the price revolution of the 16th century really hurt domestic industries that were unable to export goods. So you might remember from Unit 1 that the price revolution uh, was an economic trend where, we, where increased population led to increased demand for popular goods like food and domestic products, which in turn led to inflation. So again, more demand on a limited supply leads to um, uh, rising prices. And then also the gold and silver from the Americas that was flowing into Europe in the 16th century accelerated the inflation by increasing the supply of money. And finally, a poor work ethic actually stunted economic growth in Spain. The upper classes, like the clergy and the nobility, eschewed work, meaning they didn't want to work, and they just preferred to continue a life of luxury. And many noble titles were purchased with, and, uh, with provided tax exemptions for the wealthy, so the clergy and the nobility didn't like to work and they didn't have to pay taxes. Uh, there was also an overabundance of clergy, an overabundance of priests and monks, so here we have large, luxury-loving classes and oppressed peasantry, and this is one of the reasons why capitalism was also less prevalent in Spain than it was in the Netherlands and England. Also, don't forget, Spain does not have much of a middle class or commercial class, whereas the Netherlands and England did. Even France will have a much stronger commercial class than Spain. And this, again, was because the nobility dominated the economy, the peasants were oppressed, and Spain had kicked out all those religious minorities. And so the po and even though they had all those colonies, those colonies in the New World really saw a lot of poverty. There was a very low population. And so that, in turn, did not support colonial markets and mercantilist policies very well. So the colonies allowed for some short-term profit, uh, a short-term sense of affluence, but really in the long term, 
they did not benefit Spain as much as colonies for Britain and North America and uh, things like that. In addition to the economy, uh, there was significant political and military decline in Spain. Symbolically, England's defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 was once seen by some historians as the beginning of the decline of Spain. And I still think that's a fair assessment. Um, it's sort of the, the beginning of the end. But we do have to keep in mind that Spain continued to have the most formidable mil military until the mid-17th century, when it is then going to be uh, uh, replaced by France. So by overall, we can safely assume that the Spanish army declined as the economic situation of Spain declined. <clears throat> there was definitely an increase in desertions and mutinies of soldiers as the state was unable to pay them, which makes sense. Why do you want to continue working a job that doesn't pay you? Now, the other contributing factor here is the very poor leadership we start to see in the Spanish monarchy, especially by three successive kings, Philip II, uh, Philip, the, I think actually it's supposed to be Philip III, excuse me. It was Philip III, not Philip II, if you want to fix that, Philip IV, and Charles II. And wait till I tell you about Charles II. Now, Philip III was known for his economic mismanagement and focus on luxury. Uh, under his leadership, the weakness of Spain started to become apparent. And this continued with Philip IV, but really the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae is poor Charles II. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner here, we have a portrait of Charles II. Uh, this is the last Habsburg king of Spain because the Habsburg monarchy literally inbred themselves out of existence. Below his portrait, you can see his family tree, which is really more of a shrub, not so much a tree. And uh, it turns out his parents were uncle and niece because it was a Habsburg tradition for them to marry each other to protect their land and their money. So as a result, Charles had severe physical, intellectual, and emotional disabilities. He was also infertile because Mother Nature has a way of shutting these type of unnatural things down. He actually has this nickname in history, El Echizado, which means the bewitched. His, his disabilities were so severe that he did not learn to speak until he was at least four years old. He could not walk until he was about eight years old, um, and so he would just get carried around from place to place because of his incredibly oversized jaw, this almost comically large Habsburg jaw, of course, due to inbreeding. He could barely speak or chew when he ate. Food would just dribble out of his mouth, drooling constantly. Uh, he did not go to school, so he was not educated at all. He was not required to bathe or be clean. Uh, but yet, he was the king of Spain, and he actually uh, was married twice. I think his first wife may have killed herself. Um, but despite this, he did not have any children, and he lived, surprisingly, to be 39 years old. Um, but when he dies, we will see that this does create a crisis in succession, and there's going to be a big war over it that we'll talk about later in this lecture. Spain also was on the losing side of the Thirty Years' War, as much as there was a losing side, and this was, of course, under Philip IV. And uh, this, as a result, Spain's participation in the Thirty Years' War was politically and economically disastrous. In the Treaty of Westphalia, Spain officially lost the Netherlands. Yes, the Northern Netherlands had rebelled against Spain and had been de facto independent for the better part of 80 years, but at the end of the Thirty Years' War, Spain also lost the Southern Netherlands, what is modern-day Belgium. Those actually got transferred to Austria. And also, like I said in, those, uh, in an earlier slide, those rebellions we see in the 1640s led to Portugal reestablishing its independence from Spain. Uh, Portugal had been absorbed into Spain during the reign of Philip II. So for 
a little less than a hundred years it was actually a Spanish possession. Now the Treaty of the Pyrenees in 15, in, I'm sorry, in 1659 marked the end of Spain as a great power. Uh, this treaty ended the war between Spain and France, which had continued for another 11 years after the end of the Thirty Years' War, which, as we know, was an exhausting, disastrous war for much of Europe. And, like I said, Spain would lose uh, parts of the Spanish Netherlands as well as territory in northern Spain to France. So, uh, in addition to France sort of coming out on top of the Thirty Years' War, they also definitely are the victors in this Franco-Spanish War that would end in the Treaty of the Pyrenees. By, seven, by the year 1700, the Spanish Navy had only eight ships. Yes, you heard that right. Single digits. Eight ships in its Navy, and most of its army consisted of foreigners. That means it was missionaries, or not missionaries, excuse me, mercenaries, mercenaries, so soldiers for hire. So the Treaty of the Pyrenees was a big turning point. But I think the fi final nail in the coffin was the War of Spanish Succession, where Spain lost most of its European possessions due to the Treaty of Utrecht and definitely became a second-rate power. More on the War of Spanish Succession in our next part of the lecture, which we will begin now, the Wars of Louis XIV. So our objective for this, sec for this uh, section is to explain how European states attempted to establish and maintain a balance of power on the continent throughout the period of 1648 to 1815. And that's really the theme of this lecture, is balance of power. Uh, we talked about that concept in Unit 1 in the context of the Italian city-states during the Renaissance. But we will also start to see now that this is really becoming a guiding principle in international European politics as we get farther into the modern era. The key concepts for this lecture, after 1648, dynastic and state interests, along with Europe's expanding colonial empires, influenced the diplomacy of European states and frequently led to war. And Louis XIV's nearly continuous wars, pursuing both dynastic and state interests, provoked a coalition of European powers opposing him. And the major theme, because we're talking about war, of course, is going to be political. So let's start with a brief overview on uh, this period and the wars of Louis XIV. So Louis XIV, like many European monarchs, subscribed to the common European belief that war equals power. War is how he showed off his greatness and masculinity and his power and his virility. War is basically how he got his name in your history textbook. He had an ambitious desire to increase his own royal power and glory. And really, his overarching goal in all of this was to expand France to its natural borders, as he saw it, and also to protect France from invasion. His military advisors at the time believed that France was vulnerable to an attack. But really, what we will see is that he's just trying to expand French territory as much as possible. Now, his wars were initially successful, but eventually they became economic uh, economically ruinous to France. Um, France, however, throughout this process, developed the first professional modern army that we are used to seeing. And this is, and these wars were actually the, probably the first time in modern European history that one country was able to dominate politics. We really had not seen this happen since the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne, and before that, the Roman Empire. So as I said in the objective, uh, balance of power is really the theme here. A balance of power system emerged in response to the threat posed by Louis XIV. Europe made it very clear that no one country would be allowed to dominate the continent since a coalition of other countries would rally against a threatening power. So we will see several examples of that during the wars of Louis XIV, and we will see many more examples of this as we study other wars throughout history. 
um, such as when we get to Napoleon, another very ambitious French leader. Now, in the context of Louis XIV, it was actually the Dutch stadtholder, William of Orange, who was later King William III of England, uh, who was really the most important figure in thwarting Louis' expansionism. And that's going to be a wonderfully ironic um, political situation that we get to talk about here. So there's four wars of Louis XIV that we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to start with the first one, the War of Devolution. Now, before I get into this, I also want to remind you that these four wars made it so that Louis was at war with other European states for about two-thirds of his entire reign. So this consumed much of his energy and his money. <clears throat> so anyways, the War of Devolution is also sometimes referred to as the First Dutch War. And it began when Louis XIV invaded the Spanish Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, without declaring war. His reasoning for this is he was concerned with the threat of Spanish power on the French frontier, because remember, Spain still had this reputation of being a powerful state historically. And I think at this point, France was starting to smell blood in the water. They, they recognized Spain's weakness. Um, but also, Louis believed that these lands should devolve, meaning they should, uh, like, be given to Louis the 14th because Louis believed that the Spanish king had failed to pay the dowry of Louis's Spanish bride Maria Theresa. So basically Louis believed that he deserved this Spanish territory and like I said he recognized Spain's weakness and thought well I'll just take it. So it took a triple alliance of the Dutch, the English, and the Swedes to force Louis to sue for peace. Uh, so this is the first example of that emerging balance of power principle. And it is remarkable, even at this early stage, that we can, that such an alliance is necessary to defeat France. It's, t it's showing us how powerful France was at the time. So the War of Devolution ended with the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle. And in this treaty, Louis received 12 fortified towns on the border of the Spanish Netherlands, but had to give up a region known as Franche Comte, which is more or less in uh, this region called Burgundy, kind of in uh, on the German side of France. He had to give that up to Spain. Um, and Louis was not happy with this. This, was, this was, did not satisfy um, his ambition. Twelve fortified towns on the border, pff, that's, that's nothing. So, and Louis was also resentful of the Dutch for forming an alliance with the English and the Swedish, um, in addition to not being satisfied with the outcome. So, it did not take long for Louis to wage war against the Netherlands again. And this one is called the Dutch War. This is the second war of Louis XIV. So, Louis had invaded the southern Netherlands again as revenge for the Dutch opposition in the previous war. He also wanted to break the alliance that had defeated him in the first war. He wanted to break that alliance of the English, the Dutch, and the Swedish. And he was successful in at least convincing Charles II of England to side with the French. Remember, this is connected to that secret treaty that Charles and Louis had. They were also cousins. And in that secret treaty, Charles II uh, promised to relax restrictions on Catholics in <clears throat> England and in return um, also gave Louis some support in the Netherlands. And Louis, of course, gave England money. So the Dutch, however, decided in the wake of this potential French invasion to flood their countryside and even uh, parts of Amsterdam by opening the dikes um, that held out the seawater. So the Netherlands is part of this region we call the Low Countries because it is below sea level and places like Holland, which is um, a province right on the coast there, there's parts of it that are actually below sea level. And so the Dutch had, have had to build up these large sea walls, basically. They're called dikes. Uh, they're still there. And uh, the Dutch actually decided to open the dikes and flood their countryside, flood their cities at times, to prevent France and England from invading Holland, which, of course, was their 
uh, most uh, profitable province. So for this war, it took an alliance of German forces, Spain and Austria, of course combined with the Dutch, to force Louis to end the war. And the peace treaty that ended the war is the Peace of Nijijavivin. And yes, that's how you say it. Or at least I'm going to assume so, because I have no idea how it's actually pronounced in Dutch. So I just say Nijijavivin. Um, however, in the Peace of Nijijavivin, France received the, ter the territory of Franche Comte back, which they had lost in the First Dutch War. Now, these two wars may seem like a big deal, but they actually were nothing in comparison to the second two wars. Basically, each war gets bigger and bigger. So the next war was known as the Nine Years' War, or it's also sometimes called the War of the League of Augsburg. <clears throat> So Louis launches yet another invasion of the Spanish Netherlands in 1683. He's just not going to give up now, is he? Really, this was to take advantage of Habsburg weakness. By, by this point, like I said, very apparent that Spain is on its way out. Um, in this invasion, France also annexed these regions known as Alsace and Lorraine, uh, I realize that's not on the PowerPoint here, so if it's on your notes, let me spell that for you. Alsace is spelled A-L-S-A-C-E, and also this part, the region of Lorraine, L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E, and these were regions that are currently in eastern France, but at the time they were considered part of the Holy Roman Empire, and we will see really... For, for much of modern history, these are regions that are fought over uh, a lot, especially between France and, and Germany, once Germany becomes a thing. Anyway, in response to the League of, uh, in response to, you, to Louis's invasion of the, the Netherlands, once again, uh, this, pro this uh, provoked uh, the creation of the League of Augsburg. And this is the biggest alliance to challenge France so far. It included parts of the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Sweden, Bavaria, and Saxony, which were German states, and of course the Dutch Republic. And like I said, this large alliance continued to demonstrate this concept of the balance of power. Um, now this war was much longer, as you can see, much more hard fought. It caused economic depression and famine in France. And this is really where France really starts to feel the effect of this constant war. Now, William of Orange, who had successfully defended the Netherlands against Louis in the first two wars, was now ironically king of England uh, as a result, of course, of the Glorious Revolution, which I just think is this lovely twist, ironic twist in history. And so William of Orange, as the king of England, is able to really finally stick it to Louis by bringing England in against France in the War of the League of Augsburg. And this initiated a period of Anglo-French military rivalry that lasted until Napoleon's defeat in 1815. But if we're being really honest here, um, there's been an Anglo-French rivalry going on since the Hundred Years' War, if not earlier. But still... This period, uh, from about uh, the 1680s to the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, some historians actually view this second intense period of rivalry between England and France as like a second Hundred Years' War, which is sort of an interesting way of, of categorizing and thinking about history. So just kind of keep that in mind, that between now and the time we kill Napoleon, uh, England and France are going to be at each other's throats, uh, at least until Germany becomes a thing. More on that's another story for another day, of course. Now, the War of the League of Augsburg ended essentially with the status quo prior that was that we had prior to the war. The war uh, Louis did not really gain or lose much, and the peace treaty for this war was the Peace of Vergesovic. Um, like I said, it really just preserved the status quo. France remained in control of Alsace and also the city of Strasbourg, which was in the province of Lorraine. So again, if you need spelling, you can see those, the names of those provinces down there at the bottom. 
And finally, the last and greatest war of Louis XIV was the War of Spanish Succession, or War of the Spanish Succession. This was definitely the longest and the hardest fought of all of Louis's wars. And this is why I began today's lecture discussing the decline of Spain, because really the decline of Spain provided a context, it provided an opportunity for France to rise to power, and it provided a motivation for Louis to wage all these wars. He wanted France to be the new dominant country in the wake of Spain's decline, but also the, span the decline of Spain is what ultimately led to this pretty significant war, the War of Spanish Succession. So the ultimate cause of this war is that after Charles II, of course that last Habsburg king of Spain died, childless, I guess thank, thank goodness for that one, he had actually said in his will that all the Spanish territories, including Spain and all its, and its uh, colonies, would be given to the grandson of Louis XIV. Um, and this is probably because of some, of some family relations, because remember, all these monarchs are related in one way or another. But the problem was that Leopold I, who was currently the Holy Roman Emperor and uh, Emperor of Austria, who was also a Habsburg, also claimed rights to the Spanish throne. So here we have rival claims on the throne. But the bigger issue is that European powers feared that Louis could potentially consolidate the thrones of France and Spain, thus creating a monster power, the mighty country of Frain, or we could call it Spance. And this country of Frain or Spance, I personally like Spance, the mighty country of Spance could destroy the balance of power if those thrones were united. And so the stakes are higher for this war than any of the others because there is a significant potential to upset the balance of power. But in addition to that, whoever wins this war would potentially inherit Spain and its empire, and that's a lot of territory. So for this war, the alliance was known as the Grand Alliance, and it was even bigger than the alliances we have seen previously. So the Grand Alliance emerged in opposition to France, and this included England and the Dutch Republic and the Holy Roman Empire and Prussia, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, and Portugal and Savoy, which is part of Italy. And ultimately, they did succeed in stopping Louis from some of his ambitions. So this war was ended with a really important peace treaty, the Treaty of Utrecht. Quite frankly, this is the only treaty that you really need to remember from this lecture, which is nice because it's also the one treaty that I can pronounce. Um, you can forget about the Treaty of Nidivivin and the other Treaty of Revivivin. Just remember the Treaty of Utrecht. So this is definitely the most important treaty between uh, the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648 and the Treaty of Paris in 1763, which, by the way, is what ends the Seven Years' War, but more on that later. So the Treaty of Utrecht maintained the balance of power in Europe, and it ended the expansionism of Louis XIV. Louis XIV would also die about two years after this war. The treaty also determined that Spain's possessions would be partitioned, and actually, in this partition, Britain was the biggest winner, which also is going to tell us a lot about Britain's emerging power in, uh, on the world stage. Britain gained the Asiento, which was the slave trade monopoly from Spain, and they also gained the right to send one English ship to trade with Spain's New World Empire. This may not seem like a big deal, but actually it is. And it also uh, uh, gained the Spanish territories of Gibraltar, as in the Rock of, and Menorca, which is also a little island in that region. Uh, the Spanish Netherlands, on the other hand, remember that's modern-day Belgium, as well as Naples and Sardinia and Milan, those were all Italian territories, these were given to Austria. And the Netherlands, meaning the Dutch Republic, 
gain some land as well as a potential buffer. I don't know why that says bugger. Sorry, it's supposed to be buffer against future French aggression. And like I said, uh, this was really the nail in the coffin for Spain. It completed the decline of Spain as a great power. So before I finish up here, um, these are two relevant images that might help you understand some elements of the war. So on the left is a family tree, and you can see um, what you know how a lot of these uh, royal families were related. Uh, you know where ch how Charles V was distantly related to the Bourbons, but also how Leopold of the Holy Roman Empire might have claimed to the throne. All of it also helps us understand how incestuous these monarchies were. And then on the right, we have a map that helps us understand uh, some of the political dynamics and what the geography was of Europe uh, following the, uh, the Treaty of Utrecht. So you can see land given to Britain, like Menorca and Gibraltar. Um, you can see that a lot of the Spanish-Italian possessions now belong to Austria in purple. Um, uh, also, the Netherlands, just north of France, modern-day Belgium, that was given to Austria, and the Dutch Republic also gained some territory. So it might be good to take a moment to study this map to make sure you understand the political geography of Europe heading into the 18th century. But to wrap things up, uh, we, I, I do want to let you know that Louis' grandson was uh, made the king of Spain. All right, so that was a win for the Bourbon family, uh, but the treaty also stipulated that the unification of the Spanish and French Bourbon dynasties was entirely prohibited. Now, one of the reasons uh, Louis' grandson was granted this uh, position is because by the time the war ended, Leopold had died, and so there really was no other legitimate claim to the throne. Um, so it, by sort of by default, went to the Bourbon family. But this also meant that the Bourbon family uh, would now control the Spanish monarchy until the present day. So just like we used to have two branches of the Habsburgs, one in Austria and one in Spain, we now have two branches of the Bourbon family, one in France and then one in Spain. And it turns out the one in Spain is still around. The one in France lost their head a few centuries back. And one of the last provisions that's important to point out about the Treaty of Utrecht is that there were some new monarchies established, some new kingdoms in Europe. Uh, so kings were formally recognized in Sardinia. This would become uh, the House of Savoy, and they eventually became the kings of Italy. And then also Prussia and Brandenburg, these territories in Germany, were now named um, a royalty as well. And we're going to talk more about the emergence of Prussia as a, as, a, as, an, as a royal state in a future lecture. And basically, these two kingdoms, uh, uh, Savoy, Savoy and Prussia, would become the sort of the, the, the nuclear uh, of uh, the, nu the nuclear, I mean, that's supposed to be nucleus. Anyways, the foundation, the seed of the future unified states of Italy and Germany. But that's another story for another day. So let's wrap things up by just going over the costs of Louis the Six, uh, Louis the Fourteenth's wars. And this is also a slide that's really important to remember as you're studying. We always want to understand what are the causes and then what are the effects. And so this is all about the effects of the wars. And as you can see, they're not good. These wars basically destroyed the French economy due to a severe disruption of trade. All of Colbert's hard work to build a strong economy for France was undone by Louis' ambition and also lavish spending. The wars were very destructive to France. About 20% of French subjects died, um, many of whom had been conscripted into the military, but also... Uh, parts of the wars were fought in France and affected civilians there. This, these wars plunged France into debt, and that debt would be placed on the shoulders of the third estate, third estate in France, which was mostly peasants. And in essence, the French government was bankrupt as we go into the 18th century. 
So these financial and social tensions sowed the seeds of the French Revolution uh, for later in the century. We're starting to see that context um, of how the peasantry is going to be taxed and oppressed and how the French government is, you know, bankrupt, in debt. And frankly, none of the other Bourbon kings following Louis XIV are going to be as effective in their leadership. We're going to see weaker and stupider French kings that will continue to drive France into the ground, and eventually it will cost them their head. But that's another story for another day. Thanks for listening, and I'm sure we will see you soon.